Hello, hi, welcome everyone. I see that we have already 53 attendees. Welcome. My name is Victor Valenti. I work for GIZ and I will be moderating this webinar today um, with, together with my colleague Marvin Stolls. This webinar is a second of a series of webinar called Resilience and Transportation. Um, this time we're gonna start talking, we're gonna talk about the lessons from India while responding to COVID-19. Uh, this series is co-organized by Tumi, Euroclima Plus as part of GZ, and also NUMO and WRI. The idea is to underscore the impacts of Corona in the transport sector and also exchange some knowledge about possible solutions that are being taken uh, around the world. So the first webinar took place uh, in April and we had three speakers from Latin America. Uh, for the second webinar, we have the opportunity to dive into the situation in India that has the, uh, had the, a lockdown since the end of March and how COVID is affecting mobility there. So for that, we have invited three guests that are on your screen. Um, Dr. O.P. Argal, Mrs. Sarika Panda and Mr. Lagu Parashar. Thank you very much for attending, for participating. It's really an honor for us to, to have you on board in this webinar. And I will present now the, the content of the webinar. So we're gonna have first Lagu presenting um, the impacts of COVID in the public transport and the measures taken so far, mostly. Lagu current work, works uh, for JZ as a senior technician technical advisor in India. He's a transportation planner and have more than 15 years of experience in planning, design, and implementation of public transportation projects, including BRTs and seat bus systems. Lagu has been part of formulating various policies and standards for sustainable transport at, sta at state and as well national level. Second, OP will address the impacts of lockdown on transport service and possible responses, as you see in your screen, from public policies to ensure sustainable mobility is not compromised. Dr. OP Argal is currently the CEO of RRI in India. Earlier, he held positions including Secretary for Transport in the state of Assam and OSD for Urban Transport in the National Ministry of Urban Development. He was also the principal author of the National Urban Transport Policy adopted by the government in 2006. OP has a PhD in Transport Economics from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, and a master's degree in Transportation from MIT in the US. At last, Sarika will walk us through the impacts of the lockdown in the environment and transport policy in India, uh, a long-term perspective. Sarika is a sustainable cities professional with specialization in civic engagement. Her current, current roles include directing the India Vision Zero inclusive streets and sustainable transportation program as associate director at Nagaro. Sarika is also a co-founder of the Hagiri Day campaign, which is India's first sustained car-free event. Sarika holds a bachelor's degree in architecture and master's degree in planning from the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. She also holds a master's degree in sociology. I thanks again for being with us. Uh, last comment before we start. I would like to ask everyone who is not speaking to mute your mics. Question can be taken from now on. You just use in your dashboard. You can use the chat function. Um, my colleague Marvin will be collecting those questions and will be afterwards moderating the Q&A session. Make sure you write the name of the speaker that you are addressing the question. And without further ado, I will hand, hand the, the floor and also the mouse to Lagu to start his presentation. So Lagu, you have the mouse and you can start. Presenting. Thank you, Victor. Welcome. 
I'll just yep. So I still don't have command, I think. Mouse. We can see the presentation. You already are you are you able to to pass the the slides? No, I'm not. Okay, so I can do it for you. No problem. Yeah, please. Okay. Good evening, everyone from India. So it's five thirty over here, and uh, I hope all of you are safe at your home. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, let's start with a brief uh, of our activities in India under the GIZ Smart SUT project we are doing. Peter, can you uh, switch on to the next slide? Yeah. So under the Smart SUT, which is uh, a, a sustainable urban mobility project, uh, uh, GIZ India is implementing uh, uh, which is on behalf of BMZ uh, with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs as in a, at a national level. And uh, currently the focus of the project are uh, three states, which is Odisha, Coimbatore, and uh, Tamil, uh, Kerala, uh, three states in India. And the focus is on implementing the sustainable mobility uh, projects. Okay, next slide. Smart SOT basically focusing on area of activities uh, related to sustainable mobility, including uh, public transportation, bus-based public transportation, non-motorized transport, digitalization, and institutional strengthening, road safety, and uh, various other uh, uh, future uh, mobility uh, things like shared mobility and electric mobility. And the uh, major focus is on the training and the capacity building, which is associated with the, all the activities uh, which we are working in India. Next slide. So this is a brief intro regarding the activities, uh, transportation activity which we are working in India on behalf of PIJ. Yeah, Victor, next. Yeah, so let's come on to the <coughs> topic which we are here. So we are in a lockdown uh, due to uh, COVID situation since March 24th. And uh, uh, let me just uh, tell that we are a population of 1.33 uh, billion uh, population country and the lockdown is so far is being followed in very disciplined way uh, by majority of the country and it has started showing the impact so that we can see the the growth rate is not exponential as the other part of the world uh, so uh, this is a good thing next Lockdown has shown a significant impact on uh, the mobility pattern of the people. And as per the Google Mobility uh, report recently published, uh, the mobility of the people has reduced uh, for various activities uh, from varying from 40% uh, to 80, 85%. Okay. So it has a huge impact, of course. And uh, uh, of course, residential areas, you can see positive because it's, it's like everybody is at home. It's a, it's like a local mobility is left only and but usually it has impacted uh, the overall mobility pattern across all the sectors yes <clears throat> lockdown has a uh, apparently huge impact on the migrated population which is uh, internal migration is very high in india which is as high as as per the previous census uh, 40 million internal migrant uh, do from the rural areas to the urban areas from one city to the other city and apparently the lockdown created a little painful impact on this population and uh, there was in the at the initial stage uh, uh, it was a chaotic situation but now it is being taken care of and there are special trains special buses which are helping the migrant 
parents and the students to reach their uh, locations respective locations and this has been taken care of but of course at the, in the first phase it was a very painful situation uh, for the migrants next yeah not to be said but uh, thanks to the lockdown we we saw something which we never seen in uh, in decades blue skies clear river in fact the skies were so blue that mountains could be seen uh, from the from one city to the other city okay the aqi level the pm 2.5 level gone down by as as below as 50 percent so uh, it was like a lockdown uh, for us was a blessing in disguise and it 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 it, it gives us that environment which probably we think we deserve okay and it leaves no argument uh, and debate on the sources of pollutions which is uh, in the environment and our rivers so uh, it's, it's 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 a different uh, scenery which we have seen in last uh, few weeks okay. next yeah let's talk about something on public transportation so uh, immediately after the lockdown uh, while there was no movement was happening and uh, uh, offices all all activities school schools colleges were closed bus transport immediately changed its role and it's become like a guardian of mobility as uh, this term was I, I adopted from one of the uitb blog which is very apt for this situation and the various bus transport organizations start mobilizing their fleet for goods delivery, uh, health workers, and the migrated for, for, for dedicated services of migrated population and the students. So there was immediate change in the role because uh, this was the requirement that particular time. And this is still happening and all majority of the bus transport organizations are uh, still providing those essential services. Next slide. Uh, these are just a few examples how uh, various bus transport organizations are working their grocery on the wheel to reach at the door of the people so that people need not to come out uh, for essential services the vending zones were created at the bus stops for for local markets as a local market for the communities next <clears throat> Yeah, and the emergency services were provided by the bus transportation, are being provided by the bus transportation. This is one of the example of the, our partner city in Bhubaneswar. And the sanitization buses were immediately customized as a sanitization uh, tunnel. And uh, in fact, uh, cold storage facilities were provided by the buses. So uh, as I said, the multiple roles are being played by the bus transport organization right now in the country, which is a commendable job. So just to give you a big picture of the bus transportation in India, we have close to 150,000 buses under the public public buses, which is operate owned and operated by close to 52 state transport undertaking in India. And uh, uh, this include the intercities, rural services and the urban services. And apparently we are, as far as urban services estimates are concerned, we are deficit in supply and most of all the bus transport authorities in india are are incurring the financial losses so uh, the situation is already was was never be very positive as far as financial of the bus transport in india is concerned <clears throat> next Yeah. So talking about the impact, how how it has a uh, the COVID has a short term and the long term impact on could have a impact on the bus transportation. So as per as per the one of the estimate that uh, it might take nine to twelve months uh, by the time we reach to that situation where uh, we will have a hundred percent uh, ridership uh, equivalent to the normal days. And if we if you look at we have a two months of lockdown phase and there will be transition phase. And post that nine to 12 months will take uh, to reach us to the normal ridership levels. But during this time, there might be, there will not be any 
significant change as far as costs are concerned. So even if you see the lockdown phase, where the buses are not operating with the full fleet, the only 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 reduction in the cost would be for material cost, which is the fuel cost. And most of the cost will remain the fixed cost, whether you run the buses or you don't run the buses. And which that fixed cost is almost in the range of 60 to 65 percent. So which is in very high. And at the same time, the revenues are not either zero during the lock, uh, lockdown phases, and even in the recovery phase, it will due to the uh, due to the obligatory social distancing, the revenue will not be as equivalent to the normal uh, normal days post uh, pre lockdown situation. So it is going to take something like from 30% uh, to 60%. Then by the time it will reach to the 100% of uh, equivalent to the normal days, it is it might take uh, nine to 12 months. Next. So as I said, uh, a, a broad estimate suggests, uh, as, I, uh, as I was, earlier I was saying that we will never be in a profit uh, profit making. Uh, bus transportation in India and uh, lockdown situation and the post lockdown situation over period of next 12 months will further incur the huge losses on the bus transportation. It would add on to the distress <coughs> uh, of the bus transport organization which they were already facing for many years and this could be as high as, as I said uh, as we have estimated it could be as high as 70 percent of the previous value. So it Currently, as far as the estimate, it is close to 3.6 billion euro. It may go as high as 6 billion euro because of the situation. And uh, as, I, uh, as I was saying that this is going to cause further distressful situation uh, for the bus transport organizations. Next. So other than the financial impact, there are other pressing issues which the bus transport organization go to face. Of course, the working capital requirement, because as of now, even uh, uh, authorities are facing challenges, even paying the salaries, basic salaries of the people, like the crew, the staff, and once this lockdown will be over, to start the operation that uh, the working capital requirement will again be challenged. Uh, there will be uncertainty in the passenger demand. We don't know how many passengers will come back and uh, what will be the demand so uh, the planning operation planning will again will be an issue and the flexible scheduling will be a requirement and this is going to be a challenge uh, for the bus transport organization again on the crew management side because a lot of crew uh, on board crew is a, a migrated population and they are not going to come back soon and this will create a situation where authorities will not be able to uh, uh, Arranged 100% fleet on the road. So this is again going to be issue training uh, to the staff of, uh, to to monitor the social distancing, uh, which is mandatory. Lack of equipment availability and the availability of the infrastructure immediately after the lockdown. These are the pressing issues, immediate issue which is going to be faced by the bus transport organization in future. Next. So, uh, post giving a picture of bus transportation, um, JIJ India issued uh, recently standard operating procedures, uh, basically for the safe operation of the bus transportation post lockdown, and which covers uh, uh, SOPs uh, for the working areas, buses and the authorities, passengers, crew, onboard crew and offboard crew, bus sheltered interchange, and the pedestrian and cycling facility. So. Uh, for for detailing of all these things, you can always refer uh, the link given in the bottom. I'll just uh, discuss about few uh, uh, few specific uh, suggestion as a part of this SOPs. Uh, next slide, Peter. Yeah. So post lockdown, uh, bus operation would require to maintain the social distancing. And to maintain that social distancing, the capacity of uh, the buses will require to be one third of the normal capacity. So if let's say, for example, if 12 meter bus has a capacity of 60 to 65, to maintain that requisite social distancing, they cannot have more than 20 to 22 passengers. 
and this will further reduce of course as we talk about further reduce the revenues and for the nine volt meter buses this will be uh, 12 to 14 as against the 45 uh, total passenger capacity now this uh, uh, how uh, the, basically uh, cities are required to mark the uh, location for the standing passenger and there has to be unidirectional movement for entry and the exit of the exit of the passenger so that there is no clash in the boarding and alighting between the passenger and very peculiar issue is related with the india in bus transportation because majority of our our uh, transaction the ticketing uh, inside the buses uh, is cash based so we are still uh, penetration of digital uh, uh, payment is still very less as low as uh, or less than five percent in the bus transportation so this is a big issue and conductor will remain uh, 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 conductor when i say it's a ticket collector inside the bus uh, which exchange the cash and uh, issue the ticket so, but in the post-COVID situation, SOP suggests the conductor role should be most or more of a crowd manager uh, inside the bus. And uh, as much as possible, cities should migrate to the digital platform for the payment. And if it is not immediately possible, so as you can see, there is a provision of the cash uh, drop box. And uh, it suggests the cities can for a few months can migrate on the flat fare. Okay, so there is no exchange of the cash and the changes and the ticketing with the conductor and this cash drop can be used for dropping the money so uh, this is one of the suggestions which is very uh, uh, specific to the bus, uh, indian cities where uh, the digital payment is still at a very low stage and uh, now to maintain this kind of a uh, social distancing of course the bus supply requirement will be very high okay and sit as so city may require may require more buses and probably city can use to hire the school transportation college transportation buses and the tourist buses which will not be available which will not be required uh, at this particular summer season and uh, other suggestions provide social distancing at, at bus stop to provide in the queue to mark uh, uh, the spot location in the queue and for a, a separator uh, uh, basically transparent curtain for the driver area so that there is no uh, physical interaction between the driver and the boarding and lighting passengers next <clears throat> sorry so as i said that uh, social distancing maintaining social distancing inside the bus will remain an issue and uh, the one there are multiple methods uh, either we increase the supply okay which will require the cost which will have a cost implication and of course uh, the hiring of additional buses the other uh, alternate uh, solution could be uh, that we 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 spread the peak demand okay in in all our cities the demand in particular peak hour is very high and which dropped after the peak hour so it is very important that we spread that demand uh, over a few hours uh, instead of one peak hour and this can be done probably following some staggering working hour and working days pattern across the city so as you can see, we have tried to demonstrate over here as you can see the passenger demand in particular hour how it can be distributed across three to four hours so we try to demonstrate it for with one example next Yeah, this is uh, using the data of Bhuvanesh, one of our partner city. We just plotted all the high demand bus stops, which have the highest boarding and lighting pattern. And this is the influence area of those high demand, one kilometer influence area of all those high demand bus stops. And, uh, uh, and we try to find out what kind of land use these bus stop, uh, this influence zone has, which is influence zone of high demand bus stop. So where the office areas, the market, the hospitals and all these things and we try to figure out what is the existing uh, uh, peak and uh, peak patterns and the demand pattern hourly demand pattern on the into, in these areas and how it can be further spread over few hours basically how to flatten the peak so as you can see top of that i tried to demonstrate with that this patia zone which is a huge high tier in the bhubaneswar has almost um, more than 15 stops and it has a high high passenger demand area so in next slide. So in the entire Patia, we divided the all uh, various land use into various categories, the IT offices and the banks and government offices and the shops. And we try to study the how, what are the current peak 
and what can be done by uh, how the staggering can help in flattening the peak so this is a this is a good example at how the database can be mobility data can be used to basically uh, uh, suggesting the staggering and demand and optimum utilization of uh, uh, transportation available with us to maintain their social distancing but of course we need to have that mobility data which is not the case in many of the cities and fortunately we have data available for one of our partner city and we managed to help them next so lastly as, as i said previously uh, the lockdown caused a distress situation uh, for most of the cities and the states and their financial conditions and it is not only the bus transport they have other priorities also included in the health sector msmes and other things so apparently uh, now cities and the states have started exploring uh, various sources of revenue they started imposing uh, uh, the additional sets and the surcharges on petrol and diesel and raising the finances to deal with this uh, post covid situation and uh, to bridge uh, the financial losses which they incurred during this period of time and which they are going to incur in the future so these are the few examples and i am sure many other states will also follow this uh, uh, to explore to raise the finances you are using uh, the various sources and this is something which is most famous source i have seen actually most common one which is being used by the states Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vita. Thank you very much for being patient. Yeah, thank you, Lagu. Thank you very much as well. Uh, now I will hand the the mic and also the the words to Opi. Opi, the the mic is yours. Thanks, thanks, Victor. Uh, can we stop sharing the screen so that? Is it possible to get the slide away? Um, yes, it's possible. But I mean, I think I just have this slide of with your name and your photo, so I think it's fine, right? Or do you okay. want to show something? No, no, I have nothing to show. Okay. I I want to try and save some more time. That's why I have no slides at all. I just want to. Uh, Okay. You know, so Lagu gave an excellent presentation on what is the impact on bus transport. And as we start coming back, how bus transport systems can be organized. I think that was an outstanding presentation. I had some thoughts on this, but I don't think I'll repeat that. I sort of completely endorse what uh, Lagu has said. What I will focus on a little more is the opportunity that this COVID has given to us to rethink our mobility systems. And as we start coming back out of the lockdown, where everything was closed, uh, as we come out of the lockdown and the experience that we had in the lockdown in terms of much better air quality, much better visibility, uh, some of the things that uh, people have seen are the kinds of things that they would like to continue seeing even after the lockdown. And this is what gives us a number of opportunities that I think we should start looking at. So as Lagu said, the challenges that we face as we come out of the lockdown are going to be one, you will have transport system operators who have incurred financial losses during the lockdown and know that they will continue to incur them for longer. So there will be a financial issue uh, for each of the operators. We will have this challenge of people wanting to be a little away from each other. Regulation will also require to keep people a little away from each other. So they will have to operate at roughly one third the capacity. That is the other problem that's going to come up. So it's really an opportunity to start thinking of more distributed systems, but relatively low capacity systems and more sustainable systems. And the one thing that it really throws up an opportunity for is to look at more sustainable cycling and walking opportunities. I would even say micro mobility options which uh, you know this is the time where we can think of them this is the time when you have fewer cars on the streets we are going to see fewer cars we're going to see less traffic this is the opportunity to start looking at redesigning our streets so that they become more friendly towards walking and cycling 
I think it's also the opportunity to start scaling up electric mobility solutions and particularly electric mobility using small vehicles, the little mopeds, the two wheelers, that kind of thing, which will be very good for short distances and which will also be very good as feeder systems to mass transit. So I think this is an opportunity that we should not miss and really go aggressively into looking at non-motorized and electric mobility, more sustainable mobility solutions. Now, uh, what Lagu didn't talk about and which I want to talk a little bit about are the mass transit systems in India. Now, as you know, about 10 or 12 cities in India have metro rail systems. And these metro rail systems are really high density. Uh, you know, at least two of them are operating at very high capacity. Uh, one or two of the others are at relatively medium capacity, but quite a few are operating at fairly low levels of ridership. So the ones that are at low levels of ridership, I don't visualize the problem for them. They will be able to continue. But things like the Delhi Metro or things like the Mumbai Metro and particularly the Mumbai suburban systems, these are going to face huge challenges because they will be operating at way below the kind of passenger ridership they have today. And what can we do there? A question that is coming up in a lot of the discussions is, should we discourage people from coming to these metros or should we do something else? The challenge is if you start discouraging people to come to the metros, they'll soon move away from them. And in the longer run, you may see lower riderships on them. So that I think is a big question mark that's coming, that if they come, if we don't discourage people from coming, then how do we transport them? I think this is again an opportunity to look at whether metro systems need to transport everybody only by the metro, or are the metro systems willing to think of themselves as transport providers and for a temporary period, provide alternative modes of transport, but through the metro brand name or through the metro system operations. So this is a question that's going to come up. Can, for example, the metro systems hire buses for a short while from the tour operators and others who really have no business right now? They're you know, looking for opportunities to do business, but nothing to do. Can those buses be hired, say, by the metro companies to operate buses on some route and provide the transportation service, even if it's not done through the metro coaches. I think that is something that needs to be thought of. Electric mobility is going to be a big, uh, you know, uh, this is the opportunity. This is the time where India needs to get its acts together on electric mobility. Have this kind of fragmented thinking of electric mobility coming together so that we have a very strong approach to how we are going to deliver on electric mobility. I think this is the opportunity. I don't want to say much more on this, but essentially to highlight again that let's not think of going back to the old business forms, but this is the time to think of how newer forms of mobility, more sustainable forms of mobility can be built in. I think this is the opportunity to build back much better than the way we have done it earlier. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, OP, for the your thoughts about the topic and we're gonna have you until then so probably you have some questions for you as well um now i'll hand over to sarika um op if you could turn off yes camera i will hand over to sarika and who will be walking us through this last presentation hello sarika the Hi, Victor. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I think a lot of things has been shared by, uh, by my co-speakers um, and presenters. So uh, I think uh, many, many uh, very, very valid points has been highlighted. So I just wanted to highlight a few more things through my presentation. <clears throat> uh, can you, I cannot change the slide. So Victor, can you help me? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, so next slide. So everyone, uh, you know, most of us know these numbers uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's very, very uh, sad to see all these numbers. Uh, but uh, somehow, fortunately, India still is under control. But, you know, even 1300 plus lives we have already lose. And when we say that even one life is important, uh, so we need to think, uh, you know, how we have to uh, 
control this situation and look forward for some new strategies next and uh, as it has uh, you know uh, basically uh, um, uh, declared as a pandemic so we can see this number is growing and this graph is growing from day zero to day 50 and plus so and it will grow still we don't get any proper medical solution to this pandemic uh, and we need to think how to control again how to control this next victor so to control this uh, before getting any medical treatment uh, two things uh, most of the government has uh, you know uh, adopted first thing is social distancing so to basically uh, you know reduce the human to human uh, uh, contact and uh, reduce the impact of the uh, covid 19 so first thing uh, we did is the social distancing uh, and then next is the lockdown so uh, uh, the lockdown is basically many countries has declared and even india has declared for almost two mo two months and this lockdown has given the time for preparation to uh, you know um, fight for um, uh, for the um, uh, before uh, the any kind of uh, vaccine or medical things uh, um, are coming and uh, this lockdown has even uh, not just given a preparation time for uh, to the government but to us as an individual also next and we have some positive and negative impacts so i want to highlight uh, most important uh, impact is you know the impact on like you know how the uh, um, urban transport the public transport uses has been declined and if you see this red line is from india lago already highlighted that you know almost 80 percent uses of public transport systems especially buses has been reduced in india and similarly in london singapore south korea and many other cities uh, so it's something to really think through and um, uh, uh, take action accordingly and because of this as people are not moving as there is no economic activities happening uh, uh, and the cities and in, uh, you know even in the rural areas there is a huge impact on economy then you can see this is from like a stock market and uh, we can see that impact and recently we saw one of the state has declared that they have loss of 95 percent gdp so something to really you know look up on and understand uh, uh, and act accordingly next So the only solution is uh, getting some kind of medical uh, treatment. And many countries, many, uh, including India, uh, are um, you know, uh, doing some kind of research to get this uh, vaccine uh, soon. But till then, uh, till the vaccine is not coming, we have to look into other solutions. Next. As I said, there is an impact, uh, you know, um, there is a negative impact on public transport, but there is a positive impact on air quality. From decades, uh, we as a uh, practitioner, as, uh, you know, as a government and many other, uh, you know, organization working hard, actually, they were working hard from decades to get the air pollution down in most of the cities. And as we know that Delhi is one of the most polluted city in the world, from last 10 years, we were debating and discussing how to reduce the air pollution in Delhi. But fortunately or unfortunately, you know, the, the COVID has given this, uh, you know, positive impact on air quality you can see uh, the November and the March. And it is not just, uh, you know, just in the picture. Next. next slide we have numbers so you can clearly see you know delhi has a, a reduction uh, 
more than 40% reduction in PM 2.5 and more than 50% reduction in uh, NOx. And similarly, in many other cities like Mumbai, Bangalore, and uh, other smaller cities also. So this has a huge impact, and we were thinking from decades, uh, and we got the solution now. And we need to, you know, uh, move forward with this solution. Second important thing is road safety. So yes, next. So there is a uh, lot of improvement in road safety. There is really, um, uh, you know, uh, declining on uh, road traffic crashes uh, globally and in India. We got some data from uh, Paris and then from China that 50% reduction happened. But before this presentation, I got the data from Haryana um, that almost 75% reduction in Haryana. So we used to, you know, um, lose around 400 people every month in Harina due to road traffic crashes. And then April is uh, reduced to 92. So, um, you know, though 92 is also a huge number, as I said, uh, you know, even a, a single life is important. But, you know, this 75 to 80% reduction in road traffic crashes. Again, we need to think how we are not going back to the, you know, old school practices and adopting some new thing to make this uh, thing sustainable the the air let the air also be clear as it's right now and after the lockdown and even the road traffic crashes also next and we we all, most of us have seen so many beautiful pictures of this wildlife coming back to cities uh, you know, multiple animals on the streets and uh, there are a lot of birds we can see around and all that. As we know that, you know, human need to live with this ecosystem and with the biodiversity. So this is again one of the, um, you know, positive impact. Next. So uh, we have to look into uh, how to respond to this and we need to respond to this in these three phases. You know, first is the lockdown. We did it. And uh, we got this preparation time. Uh, the government got the preparation time to prepare for uh, the worst uh, to come. And then uh, we opened up also slowly. India has opened up partially. And of course, the numbers are increasing. But I think it's uh, in every city and every country. But many people, what they are thinking is this opening up is the new normal. And that's the fear. This opening up is new. After the first day of opening up, we got huge traffic jam in multiple cities. So are we really uh, going to adopt the same thing? Are we really, uh, you know, uh, looking for that kind of traffic jam again? I think no. Nobody wants to. Nobody wants to have that hazy sky or, uh, you know, bad quality water uh, or, uh, you know, hearing the road traffic crisis death. So what is the new normal? So to, uh, to think of the new normal, we have to adopt these five things. So first is increased technology adoption. We all like, no, no, we are doing a lot of webinars and it's so good that we are talking and sharing our knowledge, not going to uh, traveling to multiple cities and doing big conferences. Same thing, there was a huge, you know, uh, untrust uh, that uh, working from home is not that effective. Uh, you know, and this uh, um, pandemic has proved that, you know, uh, you know, working from home is actually more and more effective. Whereas we were losing our productive time on traveling and traveling again was adding to air pollution and road traffic crashes. And we were able to reduce that. We can see lesser cars on roads has impacted on air quality and road traffic crashes. So I think this uh, work from home, adoption of new technology, I think many things will be going on, car, paying on online system and all that. So new, I think new technological in, innovation is going to emerge more and more and the pandemic has proved it. Next. The demand on transit as uh, my co-speakers has already mentioned, but you know, there is going, there will be new kind of demand on um, uh, tra public transportation. The uh, social distancing is a big threat as Lagu also mentioned in, uh, you know, public transport system. 
but i think that will there is new innovations coming i we, i saw a lot of pictures especially from my home city that you know how the buses are you know alternative seats they have occupied and the buses uh, the, they started uh, transferring the patient from one place to another helping on uh, sending uh, essential items through buses and now they are sending the migrant labor in similar way and i think a lot of new innovation is going to come uh, as the demand is going to definitely increase uh, so uh, innovation on the uh, transit demand also next and then what i say is we need to recycle our city and uh, again uh, so heartening to see multiple cities that uh, you know adopted this and how they have converted uh, the carriage way to bigger walkways and cycle tracks and all that and it is not you know it is not very difficult thing to do it's just the uh, you know willingness to do and uh, it's uh, again uh, fortunately or unfortunately a top down approach and first government has to decide that they really what they really want and and citizen uh, we need to accept it so making cycle tracks or footpath is not very expensive thing we no need to spend you know millions of rupees to do this through small tactical urbanism uh, we can convert uh and make beautiful cycle tracks as i can see in many cities putting some bollards some paints and some planters and you can create beautiful cycle tracks where actually pleasantly you know people can walk and cycle though we know that you know even cities like copenhagen and amsterdam uh, the cycling cities of uh, uh, our world uh, also not that 100% people are cycling but yes if you provide safe infrastructure there is a, there will be a huge more sir next and uh, <clears throat> the uh, fifth one is the urban deliveries and uh, because of this lockdown and the social distancing and all that most of us are dependent on this uh, deliveries and it is again going to improve more and more and somehow this all these things also going to impact in our air quality and uh, road safety because we are reducing our travels and uh, reducing fewer uh, fewer cars fewer vehicles from the street so again need to think how to enhance this more and more next last but not the least uh, as uh, um, uh, mr op agrawal has already highlighted you know zero emission transport how we can move to um, electric mobility and it is very important that you know uh, as a uh, um, mr agrawal has already mentioned that how we can uh, adopt this in the smaller vehicles like you know two wheelers electric cycles and all that the second important thing is you know the uh, public transport system buses because must if uh, in getting individual into ev is uh, i think uh, is challenging still challenging but easily and quickly we can really convert our public transport our buses uh, our taxis like you know the ola and uber of the world uh, can be converted into ev uh, very easily and it can actually have huge impact on our air quality and we need to understand even how to address the electric mobility through alternative energy not just fossil fuel next yeah this is really really very important uh, uh, and uh, again in the end i just want to highlight you know life of like you know post covid the, the what is the world that we are thinking post covid you know all this kind of uh, development that we do there are short term developments like you know capital stock and other which is which will take 10 15 years or so we don't know like you know it might take lesser but you know is uh, again short term impact then there is long term impact on capital stock but most important thing is you know infrastructure land use and urban form if you are not choosing it rightly if you are not developing it rightly if you are not planning it rightly then it will take you 100 years to basically correct it so very very important this five months has given us a lot of lessons so what we need to do is you know we need to 
think pause and then move and that that has to be our new normal and not rushing up again and going to our old ways of life uh, so here uh, next so thank you and uh, um, uh, i think uh, um, uh, you know lot to learn from this covid and let's adopt it thank you very much sarika for this interesting presentation um hi everyone my name is marvin and i'll be taking over now for the q a session also a great thank you to op and lago of course for your participation or contribution to this to, th to this webinar um, so i have seen a lot of activity in the chat function so far i've collected some questions here and what we're going to do is um, i will redirect redirect them to our speakers now um, and give them the chance to answer them and i would say we start right into it so maybe a question for um op and lagu first um while we, we talked about impact of covid 19 on the mass transit um, what about informal transport sector for example the intermediate public transport which caters to significant demand, especially in tier two and tier three cities. Operators of these modes are facing significant um, challenges right now, especially financial challenges. What should the government um, do about this? That would be the first question. Maybe OP, you wanna go first. Thanks, thanks uh, for this. Yes, I mean, uh, bus transport across the country, whether it's large cities or small cities or medium cities, they're all getting affected. And they are they are in pretty bad shape. I think as Lagu very rightly pointed out that almost, uh, I mean, almost 60% of their expenditure, they continue to meet, yet there is no revenue that is coming. The only thing that is possibly happening with some of the private operators is they may have uh, gone in for some kind of a salary cut. So the expenditure may also have come down a little bit. But financially, they're going to be in trouble. The kind of things that they are asking for, you know, what I'm hearing from many of the bus operators and their confederations is not so much making up those losses. But what they are asking for is going forward, can you help us by way of reducing some of our tax burdens and deferring some of the interest on the loans that we have taken. I think these are very, very reasonable requirements or expectations. And I, I, for one, think that the government will agree to them. What may be difficult for the government to do is actually give them a cash subsidy to make up for past losses. But any request for reducing the tax burden or deferring an interest burden, I think is very reasonable. That, that's my view, but I think Lagu uh, may be able to answer this. <clears throat> Uh, I think OP sir has uh, covered uh, already very well, but uh, uh, just to add up uh, what sir has said. So uh, yes, it is correct that the majority of our of our uh, public transport supply, uh, especially in the tier two and tier three cities, is still from uh, paratransit. Uh, it's just uh, your informal transportation system, and uh, uh, this information transport informal transport system poses a lot of competition for the formal transport system also. And but at the same time, they uh, they are they play a major role also as far as supply is concerned. Uh, yes, they will also incur the huge losses. And since they are not part of the formal system, they will not be eligible. They may not be eligible for that kind of financial support, which government may like to bring in future. OK, but at the same time, uh, uh, they are going to incur huge losses. Their livelihood has been impacted hugely and uh, maintaining social distance those kind of obligation will further impact their livelihood in future but at the same time i see it as an opportunity to reset <clears throat> the things which we were trying so many years as far as informal transport is concerned especially the shared autos auto rickshaws so let's say for example recently one of the state government has provided 5000 rupees per month support to this transport system it would be worth exploring to bring in some reforms into the informal transport system while providing such kind of financial support what if 
you will be eligible for this financial support if you install the GPS system, which they were not doing so far. If you follow the digital payment system, if you start following the metering system while charging the passengers. So financial support will be provided and I'm sure government must be thinking about it because huge population is involved in this informal transport system. But it is an opportunity to bring in some kind of a reforms in this particular sector and this opportunity should not be lost. Thank you. Thank you to you both. So um, talking about reforms, another question about electric solutions. So OP, you said that um, we should promote electric solutions now, but the electric mobility field is dominated by e-buses implemented in various cities. So should the government or should government bodies promote them or go with some other new electric solutions which are not tested in India after the lockdown period? What's your take on that? I think uh, you know the whole technology for electric vehicles is uh, fairly rapidly evolving. Today we mostly talk about the lithium-ion battery, uh, but there are other battery chemistries that are being researched. There is also a fair bit of work happening on the hydrogen-based solutions. These are evolving fairly rapidly, and uh, the question really is whether you wait for them to stabilize and then try to promote it or whether you move ahead with what is already there and there at least my view is if you're going to wait for something to stabilize then by the time that stabilizes something else will also come up i think that what the government needs to do is really get its policies together today i think that kind of an integrated policy and a good structured roadmap on how we're going to move ahead since that is missing, I think the industry is also very uncertain of how much they should produce. Everyone wants to be visible in the space, but no one is really moving forward aggressively to grab a market that they see. Today, they're not really seeing that market. I think the role that government has to play is really making sure and making, uh, you know, coming up with a policy that lays down the roadmap over the next four to five years with very clear timelines of what we will do by when. As far as new technologies are concerned, I think they should certainly be researched. Every effort should be made to go ahead with some of these technologies. I think the new battery technologies will offer a much longer range, will probably offer lighter batteries. That's going to be important for India. I think hydrogen fuel will be a very good kind of fuel, particularly for intercity traffic, long distance traffic. So I, for one, would think that, yes, we should move ahead with what we have today, but at the same time, look at new options that are coming up and see how we can deploy them going forward. Okay. Just a comment, just a comment. Uh, since we we didn't have the, uh, the time as planned for the discussion, if we agreed already with the, the speakers that we could have uh, 10, minute, 10 minutes extra time, so please feel free to still send your questions. We're gonna stick a bit of a little bit longer okay that's it okay thank you victor for that information so um next coming to the next question a more general question this pandemic has introduced a new fear of public transport what should the government do to bring in safety as an immediate action once the lockdown is open and if ac vehicles are not recommended how do you think particularly Metro can, can prepare itself, um, and here OP and uh, Lago are addressed as well. You want me to? Lago, you want to go first? No, sir, you go first. I'll just add. Yeah, please. Okay, I think it's, you know, to me, it's a good opportunity for us to start thinking of whether we want to build metros the way we are doing it today. I mean, in cities where we are seeing city after city, building metros with very low ridership in any case so i think it's an opportunity for the government to really rethink where we want to build metros as far as the metros which are already carrying a lot of people i think you need high capacity systems this is a special situation in this special situation it's causing a problem in the longer run i think we do need high capacity systems in the kind of densities that india has the question is 
how do we handle metro during this special period and as lagu said this may last about nine months or so what do we do in these nine months and in these nine months my suggestion would be metro operators should not think of them as only rail based system operators but also bring in a bunch of bus operators to supplement their services and particularly bus operators who today have no business i think that is a temporary solution that metro operators should have in the longer term we will need mass capacity systems but as i said do we need it in every city that's this is an opportunity for us to rethink that okay thank you very much op so uh, coming to the next question are there any plans for the time after the lockdown to maintain the improved level of air and water quality how can we avoid a rebound effect sarika this uh, may might be might be a question uh, for you uh, sorry sarika i think you're muted thank you sorry yeah so we have to actually we don't have any choice as we see this is you know uh, we are so worried about human life now we are giving importance to human life and uh, for example you know the we can see the best practices uh, due to covid now every day we are getting update on how many got positive cases how many uh, people we lose and all that thing so we, i'd like to highlight that you know we, every year we lose around 13 uh, you know 1.3 million people due to air air pollution in india and similarly around 1 uh, you know 0.1 million people uh, due to road traffic crashes so definitely we need to look into new policies though we have good policies but uh, still we have not adopted those policy and not practicing those policy for example nutp guidelines uh you know um, mr agrawal was part of it and hardly any city adopt that policy so we have policies we need to make it as rule now otherwise definitely we are going to face more and more such pandemics so uh, it's uh, you know just not national level state has to adopt things and even city level we really need to work on city level we need to improve the governance of cities in india rather than making it always top up top down approach some uh, policy in the national level happened and um, that people can adopt or not adopt it's not mandatory you know many things are like that but cities has to you know uh, rethink on uh, you know how to make their cities sustainable to improve their air quality already you know as we as i said you know like for uh, improving the water quality there are uh, you know billions of rupees has been sanctioned to improve the water quality for through namami gange and other you know uh, river rejuvenation projects we have that money so this money now our rivers are clean so we don't no need to go back to the old um, practices we need to think which industries we need to uh, you know close or which industries we need to look upon that polluting industries are not in near the river bank not discharging their bad water quality to the rivers it's so simple solution and that money can be again uh, can be used on better improving better public transport system the bus system in cities uh, better walking and uh, cycling infrastructure in the cities and i must say that you know many cities has adopted this lockdown when they you know have this barricading system in multiple cities uh, you know and the road ha the streets are uh, now is acting as a public space which we used to do through ragri day has been now permanent solution during this lockdown so we need to think on multiple alternative uh, and creative things uh, and not going back to our old practices for sure thank you very much for your thoughts on that um so the next question i would like to pose uh, is again addressed to lagu so what is the average trip length on public transport in india um, as the weather will be good in india indian cities should also work towards promoting cycling cities um, i see a lot of demand on micro mobility like e-scooters and um, should it be tested in india what do you think about that uh. 
so it's very difficult to conclude india into one number so when you ask for a trip length okay so if you look at the city like delhi bangalore mumbai the trip lengths are as high as 14 km average trip length are 14 km and the tier 2 tier 3 tier 3 cities uh, the trip lengths are in the range of 5 to 8 km but even then the majority of the urban india 60% of the urban india comes under the less than 6 km of the average trip length it means that more than 70% of the trip lengths are in the range of four, less than 4 km which is conducive to the any kind of cycling facility and uh, to be covered by the cycle so trip lengths are not a question even if the trip lengths are 14 km and if the metro uh, trip lengths are happening the first and last trip of all the metro systems are for the first and last mile connectivity which is not more than 1 1.5 km which is required to be done by alternate mode like cycling and walking as far as weather is concerned uh, i don't think it could be a excuse for not providing the cycling facilities and we have seen that across the globe the weather are extreme uh, in the other part of the world the weather are as low as minus uh, 10 minus 20 degree and those are called as a heaven of cycling infrastructure and cycling uh, in the country so weather is not a probably uh, could be cannot be an issue uh, as far as initiative to be taken as sarika says i think the intention was missing somewhere so far and it does not require huge money all it required the intentions to implement something and this now this covid situation gave us the opportunity as op sir also said the cycling infrastructure is cycling is one of the way uh, to remain maintain the social distancing and uh, at the same time mobilizing so that even today the 70% of the trips are within the cycling within the trip length which can easily be covered by the cycles so now we need to go ahead and provide the conducive and the safe infrastructure for those cyclists and the pedestrians thank you very much lagu so looking at the time as well i think we might uh, only um, pose the last question for the session now and this i would uh, pose to all of you experts um, so thanks again for all the presentations the last question would be how to make the operation financially viable when the bus occupation will um, will need to fall to less than half after the pandemic this is a question posed from sao paulo brazil so i'm interested in your answers on that thank you when yeah. you want to begin okay yes, let me let me i think i think you know the big issue here is uh, where do you you know how do you want to balance the costs is your revenue or your income only coming out of fares if their money is only coming out of fares in that case bridging the gap is going to be very difficult because you will have fewer people i think this is the opportunity to look at other sources of revenue that should be coming to support bus and metro kind of operations now let me give you an example in delhi for uh, the delhi transport corporation has about 34 depots and these depots are located on prime land right in the you know many of them are in the city center areas they are prime land should we not get a little more innovative in exploiting that land for other kinds of commercial property development and using that revenue uh to also support the revenues of the bus companies now these depots today are used only for parking buses at night i think we need to get more imaginative in how we find revenues for public transport systems and not think of only fares being a source of revenue yeah <clears throat> yeah i think uh op sir is rightly uh, pointed out so far we were not focusing and in the bus transportation the penetration of the non passenger revenue uh, non fare revenue is as low as 3 to 5% which is very low and somewhere it is 1 to 2% and uh, it is the time because it's not that bus transport was not tra public transport was not in loss earlier they were always in loss of course not to that extent but the future will be huge in future they are going to incur more losses and uh, government subsidy requirement are limited were limited and will remain limited and 
public transport agencies has no choice but to explore alternate revenue sources. One of them is, as uh, Opis has talked about the real estate. They are sitting on a huge land bank, okay, that need to be exploited without compromising the service quality, which they are offering and uh, uh, using, uh, using the data uh, for an alternate revenue sources. Okay, so there could be many things which they can still do and which they were postponing and they were avoiding so far, but now onward probably they will not have any choice but to go ahead to explore these alternate revenue sources. So uh, adding to this, uh, I think we need to look upon also that how to, like, you know, we always say that public transport need to be subsidized, right? So we can build lesser roads, lesser flyovers, and we can invest that money in public transport system. And I think uh, that's a win-win situation for all of us. Like we have good public transport system, no need to drive our own car in very stressful uh, traffic jams, uh, getting good air quality and lesser road traffic deaths. So I think instead of building more roads and roads and roads, let less subsidize public transport system. And I, if I, I don't know, like if I'm right, um, but the cost, uh, you know, uh, if you still calculate the cost effective of building more roads and subsidizing, in fact, 100% subsidizing public transport system, there is a huge impact on both economically, uh, socially, and environmentally. Okay, thank you to you all for your interesting thoughts on that. And with that, I would like to close the Q&A session. Thank you all for, activity, for your activities, um, to all viewers or participants. And um, just a, a quick information, we will also try to answer all open questions um, afterwards in a follow-up email. And uh, with that, I give back to Victor for the closing remarks. Thank you. Yeah. I'll be very brief. I would like to thank all the attendees. We had more than 150 attendees uh, during the whole session. I would like to give a warm uh, thank you also to Sarika, to OP, and to Lagu for having the time to present and also to discuss with us. I think it was a very lively discussion. And I think the situation you just addressed is it's the same around many countries, so I think it's interesting for everyone to see. And also, I, I, I thought it was very interesting to see also not the bad side only, but the good side also that COVID is bringing regarding the, the transport sector. Let's use this opportunity to re really think about new ways of um, doing mobility in the cities. I would like to thank also the co-organizers, WRI, NOMU, TUMI, Euroclima Plus, uh, GIZ for this, Nagaro participating as well. And uh, to say just two quick uh, reminds, we're going to have the next webinar uh, in two weeks on the 20th of May. Uh, it will be this time uh, 11 a.m. in the Eastern time. Uh, and the topic will be lessons learned from North America while responding to COVID-19. Um, stay tuned, follow us on our social medias, and the last but not least, we're going to have on the 26th uh, of May also our Tumi TV conference, so it's in the screen. Um, you just have to access the, the Tumi website and you'll, be, uh, you'll have the opportunity to see on-demand videos, webinars and that we're, we are collecting now, and also live sessions on the topic on the 26th of May. Thank you very much again for everyone and I hope you enjoy and see you, we stay we stay in contact. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.